let's talk about what you can do about this. And let's go mm-hmm. real, you know, medically at first. So yeah. let's talk about when is it the right time to consider vaginal estrogen? Oh my gosh. Well, <laughs> First, Yesterday. the most <laughs> obvious would be when you are peri or postmenopausal, mm-hmm. and you could wait until you're noticing changes, meaning you're having difficulty with pain with sex or pain when you're wiping or pain when you're spinning, for example, or recurrent urinary tract infections. But there is a little bit of a of a thought process now that maybe you don't have to wait for those symptoms. Mm-hmm. Maybe you're in if you're in that stretch where you're in your early to mid forties, you can start preemptively using vaginal estrogen. Mm-hmm. And I don't know that there's a right answer yet, but it's a little bit like I always joke, if I stopped my neck wrinkles before they started, it probably would have been easier than like chasing them. Right. right? Always. Prevention is always a little right. bit easier. A little bit easier. So that's one clear time to use vaginal estrogen. And you and I know the preponderance of data is that it's very safe and it does not get systemic even in breast cancer survivors we know good data that's been recently published and the second and third times would be when you are postpartum if you are lactating and you are postpartum or even if you're not lactating if you're not getting your period for that first couple months your vagina and your vulva can be really inelastic and painful and not just for sex but again your underwear wiping anything and third time might be when you're on combined oral contraception or the patch, or the ring, mm-hmm. or even the progesterone IUD. So those are three times in your life, which encompasses a, a lot, lot of your years. Life. Yeah, right. I we use it a lot. You know, in a fertility clinic, we're always looking at your lining. We're talking about hormones, and I think there's this idea that well, if I use estrogen, then I'm not going to ovulate and I can't get pregnant. Mm-hmm. And even though that might be accurate in high doses, of course, because estrogen will talk back to the brain and suppress ovulation. In very low doses, it can be a supportive option. And this is highlighted by the fact that some young women who go into premature ovarian failure, when we put them on estrogen replacement because your body needs estrogen, especially if you're young and you're going through these transitions early, your body's not meant to be low estrogen. But when we put them back on estrogen replacement and their FSH drops from their brain and they'll start to ovulate again. So it's really highlighting that it's not necessarily suppressing ovulation, which also means it's not contraception. Important point if you don't want to get pregnant and you're just trying to have better vaginal health. Right. What do you talk about you know, hormone replacement therapy, maybe as a whole versus Mm -hmm. vaginal estrogen. Uh, You and I know these are the same thing, but people often, they can be really different too. Yeah, well, and I do try to break them down for patients. I typically, if I say HRT, hormone Mm -hmm. replacement therapy, or now the newer vernacular we try to use is MHT, menopause hormone therapy, which I don't really like as a term, but that's what they're trying to use. I I usually reserve that term for the more systemic therapies, Mm -hmm. like the patches or the vaginal ring that gets systemic or the pill, meaning something that's going to affect your systemic hormones as opposed to your local vaginal and vulvar hormones. And I use the term local estrogen when we're talking about vaginal and vulvar estrogen, just because I think it is valuable to be able to... um, concretely separate them because so many more women even can use local vaginal estrogen and need it even when they're younger. I think we are finally at a place where we're starting to learn that millions and millions, if not billions of women can and probably should be using hormone replacement, HRT, when they're peri or postmenopausal. But we don't have enough guidance from Menopause Society, American College of OBGYN to kind of concretely tell us that yes, put everyone on it. They have kind of Um, limited our ability to only put a certain subgroup of women on it for now. But I think you and I know that the data is evolving. And so people have to be patient because the doctors have to learn the things that they didn't know before. And there was recent data about estrogen use and, as you said, menopausal genitourinary syndrome, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That using estrogen can prevent urinary tract infections, sepsis, and death, which can be a major... I mean, we have known for so long that using vaginal estrogen is really going to prevent urinary tract infections. And I think a lot of people look at it as like, no big deal, UTI, it just takes some antibiotics. But first of all, they're terribly painful. Second of all, like you said, they can lead to sepsis, especially in old people, right. in older women. Third of all, the cost to the system of antibiotic use is skyrocketing and we know it wrecks our microbiome. So if you could use something simple and less expensive that's really going to help prevent urinary tract infections in addition to helping with sex, there's really no reason to shy away from it. But there's still a lot of reticence on the part of a lot of doctors, especially oncologists who... I know that their singular desire is to keep people alive, but, but I see young, they're starting young killer. patients yeah. who are suffering, right? Yeah, they really are. And the urologists are the really the ones who have led the charge in this. So we have you and I as OBGYNs have to tip our hat to the urologists because even though we theoretically are the ones taking care of women the most, they've really done a great job at spearheading this particular yes. endeavor with urology as far as vaginal estrogen. So it's great. Okay. Testosterone. Yes. Go. Okay, I love that we are finally talking more about testosterone because, again, let's repeat, we have more testosterone in our system than estrogen, which I never knew from medical school. I didn't know in residency. I think I only learned that five years ago. So we know that it's important. Right now, sadly, the only real indication, which is off-label, 
non-FDA approved, but we would use FDA approved male doses mm -hmm. for women. So again, off label for women. And we would use it only for postmenopausal women who have <laughs> the longest term, HSDD, hypoactive sexual desire disorder, meaning you're postmenopausal, you don't have libido, then your doctor or your clinician can prescribe it for you through the regular pharmacy. These are not pellets. These are not non-FDA approved formulations. They're FDA approved for men, but not for women. But again, off-label, we can use them. And they're very safe as long as you keep women within the, the regular physiologic dosing. I think what happens is you have a lot of clinicians who are giving very high doses, yep. and it's giving testosterone a bad name. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're starting to learn that it's more than just for sex, that it can help our brain, it can help our bones, it can help our muscles, probably a variety of things because we have testosterone receptors. And then we also have local testosterone that we can use vaginally because we were realizing even more that part of the vagina and vulva is really sensitive to the androgens, to the testosterone, mm. sometimes even more than estrogen. So it's ever evolving. And the worst thing that happened is that we genderized testosterone and right. made it a male hormone and estrogen was a female hormone. We need all three, estrogen and progesterone and testosterone for us to really be not in balance, but what was the word that you used? Um, functioning appropriately, I don't yes. remember, but it was so good. I think one thing that's important, especially postmenopause, when you're not having estrogen, testosterone becomes even more essential mm -hmm. in your day-to-day -day function. And I think when it comes to premenopause, especially if you're trying to get pregnant, I see a lot of patients who are put on testosterone but trying to conceive. And this, of course, is a huge no-no yeah. because if you get pregnant with a female fetus, taking exogenous testosterone can virilize this female, this fetus, meaning the female genitalia, you and I both know this, can yeah. turn out no longer female because they're very sensitive to androgens at a certain time period in gestation and how that determines your development of your genitalia. Also, high doses of testosterone in premenopausal women can thin out the uterine lining, much like progesterone does, but even more profoundly, mm -hmm. making it exceedingly hard to get pregnant and even preventing ovulation. So I'll see these young women who went to go see somebody, some hormone specialist, mm -hmm. and I always feel terrible for these patients because they know something's off. They're advocating for themselves. They get random hormone levels drawn. And maybe they're in the follicular phase of their cycle and they've got some estrogen and a lower testosterone and a lower progesterone and they get told they're estrogen dominant mm -hmm. and they'll get put on some pellet that's got testosterone and progesterone in it. That can't be removed. That can't be removed. And now they're not ovulating and they have these other symptoms. And some of the symptoms of testosterone exposure can permanently change your body. I will never forget the patient who I'd known for a long time who walked into my office and I thought, gosh, her voice sounds a little bit different, a little bit deeper. And she had been a weight trainer. And so we're chit-chatting about life, how's she doing, what's going on, how's her family. I go to do her exam and Natalie, oh, I, no, I will never be as shocked as I was that day. When I literally looked up and I said, um, were you going to tell me that you're using testosterone? And she said, how did you know? And you and I both know because I was looking at what was the largest clitoris in the world, clitoromegaly. Right. And again, you and like I know, it looks like a small penis and you don't want a very large clitoris like that. And that can be irreversible. Mm -hmm. And she was being seen by someone who was an MD who was treating her with very high doses. Oh. And she had voice changes. She had significant hair growth on her chin and on her neck. And then she had clitoromegaly. And it was shocking. And she actually was really surprised. She said, I didn't know you'd notice. Wow. <laughs> and I thought, oh, gosh, so many parts of this are wrong and sad for women in our system, right? Right. And yeah. she'll have permanent voice changes, this clitoromegaly. Yeah. In addition to being irritating, can cause a lot of pain and other problems, it's not going to just go away. Right. I had a similar patient in fellowship, and she was 70, though, but she had an androgen-producing tumor. Yeah. So she came in with this deepening voice and this growth down below because, of course, we don't talk about her anatomy with right. appropriate terms, so she had a very hard time describing it. And same reaction. I went and looked, and I knew exactly yeah. why I said, are you using testosterone? She said no, and right away thought she must have an ovarian tumor. Right. And that's just showing us kind of that Hormones are not benign. Right. They do have to be prescribed by somebody who knows what they're doing and can really talk you through the pros and the cons. And I always yeah. think it's a really red, big red flag if you're getting hormones from, you know, maybe that clinic within itself, yes. right? If I that agree. physician is profiting off the hormone, yeah. it's a little bit concerning about do they really understand? Because most of us are going to lean towards FDA approved medications yep. if they exist. And like you said, even if they don't exist for women, you're using a safe and a tested medication, yes. just a little bit off label.